Hello and welcome to this Dot Connector video cast for subscribers to DavidIke.com. Well, the Dot Connecting uh, theme this week is demonize and then destroy. It's a technique that has been used through uh, the ages and there are endless examples of it. For instance, um, I remember in the 1950s and 1960s, I was a big fan of railways and steam trains. And there was a plan to uh, take out of service, delete, close vast numbers of railways in Britain. So to head off the public reaction against that, they allowed the railways to just go down and down and down through lack of investment, lack of repairs, lack of cleaning, um, lack of everything. And what happened, of course, uh, it wasn't the only reason, but it was a, a very significant reason, is that fewer and fewer people used the railways and more and more people complained about them. And so when eventually along came uh, a, a report in the 1960s saying we need to close all these vast numbers of lines, there was a much smaller public reaction against it than there would have been had the railways been highly efficient, clean and all the rest of it. We're seeing the same technique, demonise and then destroy, being used now in the British National Health Service, the NHS, which is supposed to be a, a social um, health care system where people, this was the original idea anyway, people are treated free at the point of need. But what's been happening is for many, many reasons, uh, calculated incompetence, uh, wasted money, uh, in some areas, uh, massive lack of investment, um, a focus on um, responding to uh, disease instead of uh, looking at ways to stop disease manifesting in the first place. All these things have uh, brought together an ongoing crisis in the National Health Service. And one of the, the key foundation reasons for all that is that the hidden hand wants to privatise the National Health Service, hand it over to uh, private corporations, which will be motivated not by the health of the nation, uh, but by maximising profit with all the consequences for people that that will entail. So the more crises, the more uh, you can make the National Health Service not work, the, the more you are diluting this resistance to more and more privatisation. Well, it can't be worse under privatisation. Look at it now, is the reaction they're looking for. And so um, this week we have seen, well, not just this week, crikey, it, it's a clearly uh, a, a, an ongoing um, systematic um, attack. We have seen demonise and destroy uh, being used to uh, target freedom of speech the very basis of human freedom, the freedom to be able to um, use your vocal cords to say what you think. Now, once that freedom's gone, all other freedoms are going. And freedom of speech from every angle now is being targeted. And it's being targeted through this technique demonize it and then destroy it. And the more you demonize free speech, the more you associate free speech with something kind of extreme, then again, the more support you uh, gather in your campaign to take it away. So this week we've had um, at the, uh, the Labour Party uh, conference in Britain, the Labour Party is the main opposition party here. We've had uh, this uh, furore, this hysteria over um, people at a 
fringe meeting, not actually part of the main conference, but connected to it, um, calling for everything about Zionism to be open to discussion. Now, you know, I may have been um, a, a, around quite a bit, 65 years now, um, and um, some people may think, oh, that's old, he's old, he is. But um, I do remember a time when freedom of speech was something that people cherished, that people knew um, was vital to all freedom. And of course, freedom of speech has always been um, attacked uh, by the forces of tyranny. It's always been uh, um, a target, but never more so than now, um, certainly in the, the Western world. Um, except those times, like in Nazi Germany, when uh, the fascists took over, um, or their mirror-like alleged polarity, but actually exactly the same, really, uh, communism. Has, um, has taken over various areas, various countries. Apart from those examples, freedom of speech has never been more in the firing line. And what demonize and destroy does is it inverts reality. So when the Nazis were taking over Germany. Like all tyrannies, they targeted freedom of speech. It's very simple. Um, people um, get their perceptions of everything from information. And if you can uh, control the information so they get this, that you want them to hear, but not that which you don't, then they're more likely to have a perception that suits your agenda. So whenever a tyranny, left, right, has taken over, the target has been freedom of speech. What the Nazis did was they burned the books of people that were saying things they didn't want them to say. Uh, uh, they were breaking up public meetings of those that were trying to expose them. Usual story, it happens all the time. And from a, a freedom of speech or a freedom in its entirety point of view, you would look at that and you would say, that's outrageous. Taking away freedom of speech is outrageous what the Nazis did. But now we're having this inversion where people calling themselves anti-Nazis are targeting freedom of speech. Whether it's um, so-called progressive groups around the world, the non-liberal progressive groups, which is most of them from what I can see, um, and, and the Zionist attack groups who, who want to silence any criticism of Israel, they're, they're acting like um, the Nazis did in terms of targeting freedom of speech and freedom of expression. And what what is happening is there is a blatant and ongoing attempt to reverse perceptions of freedom of speech so that instead of being the very basis of freedom it becomes a demon it becomes the new evil and from where I'm coming from to say that something can't be debated, whatever it is, is outrageous. It's, it's in terms of freedom, it's extraordinary in its extreme. Because it's a simple fact that once you, um, once you censor speech, information, at the point of delivery, 
then someone is deciding what should be censored and what shouldn't. And do we really think in our terminal naivety that those that make those decisions will not make those decisions on the basis of what suits them and their agenda? So you can hear this, what suits us, you can't hear that, doesn't suit us. So once you start censoring speech, for instance, at the point of delivery, then you are already in a, a, a tyranny where someone is deciding what people can and cannot say. Now, I'm not for a moment uh, suggesting that there should be no consequences for what people say and what people do. Of course they should. But when people say, oh, you can't say that, it's, 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 um, it, it's inciting to violence. Well, there are laws against incitement to violence. You know, if you're, if you're standing out, outside a, 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 a building saying, burn that down with all the people inside, we hate them, burn them down, there's laws against that. Once you bring that to the point of delivery, now you're censoring what people can say. Now someone's deciding what people can say and can't say. And we've gone so deep into this now to the point where almost every day there's something else you can't say. There's another opinion you can't have. And each of these censor groups, whether they are Zionist, whether they are Muslim, whether they are uh, transgender, whether they are this burgeoning explosion of groups um, that want to censor what anyone can say about them. Once, once we, um, we reach the point that we have now, then freedom is disappearing down the freaking plug off so fast. And each of these um, interest groups um, is for their own reasons seeking to silence any criticism of them. Now you put that together in its totality and we're fast reaching the point where you can't criticize anything or even have, not even criticize it, have an opinion about it. Have an opinion about even part of it. Yeah, this is my philosophy. Everyone should be free to live their life as they see fit. If they want to go through transgender, good luck to you, mate. They want to uh, promote Zionism, um, good luck to you, mate. If they want to promote uh, any religion, good luck to you. Want to promote any way of seeing the world, good luck to you. But there's a but, and it's a freaking big but. I have a right to have a different opinion. I have a right to say what I think about these things. Not that you shouldn't do it. Not that you shouldn't be it. Not that you shouldn't promote it. But that others should have an opinion about it. And that opinion should be treated um, in terms of freedom the same as their right to have their opinion. Because this is where we are now. Different self-interest groups can say what they think. But people who have a different opinion cannot say what they think. And um, there's a word for that. I think they call it fascism. I do believe they do. And we need to realise that this is happening and that it is systematic. This has not happened by chance. It's being done to advance an agenda of global human control, fundamental to which is the inability of people to criticise, challenge and expose that global control and where it's going. You know, when Google and Facebook 
announced that they are going to um, uh, target the circulation, in effect, of so-called conspiracy theories, um, then what they're saying is, we are going to take as our norm what is accepted political, social, scientific fact. That's going to take as their norm. And anything that challenges those norms is a conspiracy theory and we're, we're going to um, target its circulation. How has the human race ever moved on in its knowledge, in its sense of the world, in its sense of everything, in its understanding? How has it ever moved on? By people challenging norms and showing the norms to be a nonsense. Look at all the things throughout human history that at that time were considered um, political, social and scientific fact. No question, it's fact. And because people, often courageous people, because of the environment they were operating in, expose the fact that these facts were a freaking nonsense. And so people moved on. The world moved on. The human race moved on. Once you stop accepted norms which have an historical record of being uh, uh, superseded and shown to be uh, not what they claim to be. Once you stop the norms being challenged and questioned, once you stop historical narratives being uh, debated and questioned and scientific uh, orthodoxy, you reach a point where you start to go round and round because the status quo cannot be challenged. Thus, the status quo just solidifies and solidifies and solidifies and all expansion of awareness, expansion of understanding uh, grinds uh, to a halt. And we're seeing this so blatantly with um, this uh, progressive agenda of stopping um, anyone that says anything that's different to what they think from being heard, safe spaces, deplatforming people, in other words, banning people that are saying something you don't agree with. What this is doing is solidifying the norm. And it is also intimidating those that don't accept the norm into silence. And so we get the most extreme and the most effective form of censorship, which is self-censorship. People don't challenge it anymore. People don't say what they think anymore. They just stay quiet and let the, the tyranny, the bullies prevail. Well, it ain't happening here because after 30 years of abuse and ridicule, what people say about me is completely in one ear and out the other, without touching the sides. And Twitter storms, and your point is, we have to stand up to this and not let the bullies prevail, not let the censors prevail. People who are censoring others for no other reason that protect their own belief system and protect their own narrative. It's time for the human race to get off its fricking knees while we still can. <laughs>